All right, so we'll, we'll get started. Um, we have a, a, a special one today, one that's very close to my heart. We are going to talk about the rise of monasticism. Um, so a lot of times when, when we talk about monasticism, people will automatically jump to St. Anthony in the desert as kind of the, the first among the ascetics. Uh, but it's, it's really kind of a, a, a misunderstanding. Uh, so St. Anthony does have a central place in the rise of monasticism, but there was a great deal of precedent before him, right? Uh, the, one could argue that the, the monastic par excellence is actually John the Baptist. It was John the Baptist who went into the desert. John the Baptist, at a very young age, lived a life devoted to Isichia, silence, stillness, uh, prayer, and the worship of God. But even, even St. John the Forerunner was himself not really the first to embrace this life of intentional uh, virginity, poverty, and prayer. Uh, we see this also in the prophets of the Old Testament. The, the prophets like Elijah uh, were also, in many ways, forerunners of uh, this monastic movement, this ascetic movement. Um, and uh, we even have uh, alluded to in Chronicles and the Book of Kings an idea that there's almost a, a prophetic school, right? That there were groups of prophets. Uh, more often than not, there weren't groups because most of them uh, were either killed or fell away. But uh, groups of prophets that lived in some sort of community life. Um, some people uh, look at organizations or groups like the Essenes as a similar but uh, a little bit different. The Essenes were a group that uh, those of you that are familiar with the Dead Sea Scroll, see the community that basically wrote those Dead Sea Scrolls uh, were the Essenes. Um, the Essenes really weren't so much a, a proto-monastic group. Uh, that has been a theory for a time, as much as they were kind of, uh, uh, they, they were more akin to that uh, uh, crazy group that, you know, moves out to a compound because they think the world's going to end. Yeah. That's literally what the Essenes thought. Um, but so, when St. Anthony does come along, there's not, uh, he's not starting anything new. Um, in fact, we have already uh, references, beginning with St. Paul, of, of widows, right? Uh, and, and we can kind of read between the lines that these widows had a, a ministerial intercessory role. Uh, we know in the church of Persia and Syria that there were groups called the Covenanters, groups that, uh, uh, at least in the case of Persia, didn't initially go off into the wilderness, but actually stayed connected to the parish, uh, but lived communally and lived in celibacy. Um, uh, in many ways, these groups, and, and later Cenobitic monasticism, which we'll, we'll get into, uh, kind of organized, had as its prototype uh, the writing in Acts where it talks about how all the people came together, everything was held in common, and they spent their time in worship and the breaking of the bread. Uh, and that really became the model for the Cenobitic monasticism. But before we even get into that, uh, again, uh, it existed. There were monastics, there was asceticism, John the Baptist, the prophets, uh, these groups, especially in Syria and Persia, uh, but Saint Anthony was in many ways the the one who opened the floodgates, right? uh, uh, really changed. It became a, a very established part of the church with Saint Anthony, and there, there's a number of reasons for that. But I do want to just share a little bit about the life of Saint Anthony. Saint Anthony was. Uh, a native Egyptian who was Coptic. He would have spoken Coptic. There's some debate on whether he actually knew Greek or not. Uh, and at a very young age, he, he was orphaned. Uh, he was 18, 19 years old when his parents died. Uh, he was relatively well off. 
you could consider him and his family upper middle class. They were property owners. Um, and uh, he had a sister. But one day he goes into the church, and there in the church, the priest is reading the gospel. It's the gospel account. Uh, take all that you have, sell it, and give the money to the poor, and come and follow me. So what does St. Anthony do? He goes home. He finally arranges uh, his sister to be taken care of, uh, this, these groups of widows, kind of these proto-nuns. Uh, takes all the money, gives it to the poor, crosses the River Nile, where, again, there's, there's kind of these proto-monastics, these men that have removed themselves from the city to devote their time and prayer and contemplation and study of scriptures, and he begins to learn from them. And St. Athanasius, who wrote his biography, says that he was like a bee. He would fly to the different flowers, the different wise, wise men. He, he would go to one who was known for his ability to, to chant the Psalms, and he would learn from him. He would hear of another who was able to memorize the Gospels, and he would go and he learned from him. So he, like a bee, he would go around and collect the nectar. And ultimately, uh, he decided to, to go further into the desert, uh, to not be distracted by the noise of the world. And so he begins to go off into the desert, and there the devil, seeing the path that he's, he's making, seeing that uh, the desert is going to be turned into a new Eden, by his, his, his deeds, by his prayers, the devil begins to try to tempt him. Tempts him by uh, silver, by gold, placing it in front of his path as he goes deeper into the desert. Now, there, there's something here to, to remember. Uh, it's hard for us to, to realize in our day and age because, one, we have so much. Right? We have roofs over our heads. We have water. We have food. Uh, you know, it's kind of mind-boggling to think that to this day, the leading cause of preventable death on this planet is unclean drinking water. Right? When we can walk into any building in this country just about, uh, except for maybe Michigan, uh, and turn the faucet on and have clean drinking water. Unbelievable. Uh, you know, the, the aristocracy of 100 years ago doesn't live as well as we do, right? We have what we need. Um, we live in a culture that is all about preparing, right? You know, I'm, I'm, my son is four months old, and I've already opened a savings account for him, right? You know, we're, we're putting in these savings, you know, medical insurance, all these things, all these preparations, right? And I want you to think about that. St. Anthony walked into the desert. He didn't pack a bag, he didn't bring water, he didn't pack a lunch, he walked into the desert. Now, the profundity of that, of that faith, of that trust, I, I cannot even imagine. To begin to walk, you know, tantamount, in my opinion, to what Peter did when he walked onto the water, this complete entrusting himself to Christ, that Christ would provide for him if he did what he was called to do. So he goes out into the desert, he comes across uh, the cemetery, and he goes down into this tomb, and there he prays. And there he's assaulted uh, by the demons, they try to tempt him in all sorts of different ways. They try to draw him away. They try to terrify him by appearing as beasts and monsters. Uh, God, even as with the case of Job, allows them to, to cause suffering to his body. And at one moment, when he is about to, to be crushed by, by these demonic forces, a light comes down from heaven, it shines, the darkness is dissipated, he's healed, he's made whole, he's at peace, and he's standing in this light. And of course, Christ is in this light. And St. Anthony says, why, why did you take so long to come to me? How much I suffer. And the Lord says to him, if I had come sooner, if I had not let you struggle, you would have only been known as Anthony but now you will be known as Anthony the Great. This is something very important for us to remember. 
oftentimes I think when we think of the Desert Fathers, when we think of the monastics, we think of people that were go going to escape, right? To get away from the noise. And there is some truth to that, right? This idea of trying to find Isihia, getting away from the, the, the craziness that, of the world. But that's not the main reason, and especially in the case of the Desert Fathers. The desert from ancient times, going all the way back to the Torah, going all the way back to the writings of Moses, was understood as the dwelling place of the demons. Right? St. Anthony went not to just escape the noise of the world, but rather uh, become like uh, uh, God's special forces. Right? You know, think of the, the people that on D-Day, they were flown over and they parachuted behind the Germans. They parachuted into enemy land. Now that's what St. Anthony was doing. He was going into the place where this evil had, had dwelt, into this desert regions. And there he began to not just combat, not just intercede for people, but to actually uh, take this place, the space of the devils, and transform it into... A sanctuary, right? Transform because what happened is uh, he ends up going deeper into the desert. He ends up going into this fortress. Uh, people would come. They would bring him food. They would bring him water. One day they decide to break the doors open because they want to see him. They want to get his blessing. And he comes forth, and, and he's. It says he's. He comes forth as if from a shrine, right? And this image of him is is almost uh, a detail. Of, of almost a description of the icon of the Nastasi, of Christ coming out, stepping over the broken doors. It says that he was full of life, that he was neither uh, overweight nor had been uh, weakened by all this fasting. Uh, but we have this, this image of him almost already in this life having participated in the resurrection. And people begin to be attracted by him. And uh, one of the demons says to one of his disciples, uh, you have turned our desert into a city, a city of God, uh, because so many people go. He goes further into the desert, more people come. His disciples, people come to get wisdom from them. They begin to set up around them. Before you know it, we have all these people that are devoting their lives to prayer, to the worship of God. Um, so this is, this is, again, not the birth of monasticism, but this is really where it begins to take off, especially uh, with the life of St. Anthony. Uh, the life of St. Anthony written by his spiritual son, St. Athanasius the Great, uh, the great hierarch and patriarch of uh, Alexandria. Uh, we know that even while St. Athanasius was still alive, and he was, of course, was a spiritual son, a disciple of St. Anthony, uh, this life had been translated into half a dozen languages, right? Had traveled all over the Roman world. You know, so, so a young boy in Ireland reads the life of St. Anthony and is inspired to become a monk, right? A young boy in the edge of the Persian Empire in Afghanistan reads the life of St. Anthony and is inspired. So in many ways, it's, it's the life, the story written by St. Athanasius of the life and teachings of St. Anthony that really set this, this fire. Simultaneously, we have St. Constantine, right? St. Constantine the Great has put an end, at least in the Roman world, to the persecutions. And all of a sudden, the emperor is a Christian. So if we just kind of think without judging, but just think practically, before St. Constantine, if you were going to be a Christian, you were risking your life in most places, right? To go to church Sunday morning, just imagine how serious you had to take it if you, made, if you realized this could be my death. You took it seriously. In fact, uh, one Roman governor actually told the soldiers if you see people walking around Sunday morning, that first day of the week, 
smell their breath. If their breath smells like wine, they're either drunkards, so throw them into jail, or Christians, throw them into jail. The difference is the, the person who was having too much fun the night before started drinking too early in the day, he'll deny what he is. The Christian won't. So it was a dangerous thing. It was a risk. We lived in this time of, of martyrdom where just to live a daily life as a Christian required an, almost a titanic effort. When Constantine converted glory to God because all the weak people like me were able to come into the church, but it left a vacuum for the people that wanted to live that life more fully and zealously. Because really, that's what the monastic life is. It's, and, and our Protestant brothers and sisters, they'll accuse, where's monasticism in the Bible? But really, if you just take what Jesus said seriously, right? Because that, that's what the monastics are doing. Christ says a whole lot about poverty. And we do all sorts of uh, exegetical gymnastics to get out of the reality that God is calling us to live a life of poverty, not the monastic. Christ says that in the kingdom we will be as angels, right? We will we'll live in celibacy. And so the monastic is the one who already in this life is trying to acquire, trying to live that life of the kingdom, right? And so we think of these three main monastic vows, one of virginity or chastity, more accurately, one of uh, poverty, and one of obedience, right? And of course, uh, these are asked of us too, right? Uh, poverty, even if we have, to not allow what we have to pull us down. Right, St. Constantine, with all of his wealth, imperial purple, when he would go into the city, he would come back dressed as a beggar because he would give his robes to those in need. All that wealth wasn't able to hold him down. Meanwhile, the, the miser who has a few gold coins is unable to, to let go of them. Right, so poverty isn't so much about how much we have, but the freedom that we have in regards to what we have, what God has given us. Um, uh, obedience, of course, the obedience to the, the gospel teachings, the obedience to an elder becomes a very important part of the, the monastic life, of a teacher, of Abba, of a father. It's where the word abbot comes from, the Hebrew Abba, father, which is what they would refer to the Desert Fathers, Abba Anthony, Abba Makarios. Um, over time, though, uh, maybe about the third generation after St. Anthony, uh, you're getting to a point where you literally have thousands, thousands of, of people gathering around. And it ended up getting chaotic. Right? People would gather around Abba Isidoros. People would gather around Abba uh, Magarios. And people would come, build up, build up, and before you know it, you have all this, it, it just kind of became to be too much. It needed to have some sort of order. So St. Pacomius comes, and he begins to organize this community. Uh, and this is what's called Cenobitic Monasticism, after the Canovia where the people live in common, they eat in common, they work in common, they worship in common. Uh, and this is really what we think of when we think of a monastery, uh, this, this common community life. Whereas before, you know, you would have an elder here, you would live in a hut here, you would live in a hut here. Uh, you would kind of do your own handiwork, be responsible for your own survival. You would just go to the elder for maybe he would tell you how to live, how to pray, that sort of thing. So with St. Pacomius, we get this more organized form of mon monasticism. Uh, this is taken to the West uh, by St. Benedict, uh, and to the East, it really begins to, to proliferate because of St. Basil. 
Um, and so to this day, to this day, we have different forms of uh, these, really these three forms of monasticism. Right, there's the Cenobitic monast monastery, so like a Manaphos, the, the 20 main monasteries have this, this organization. Uh, you have this kind of idiorhythmic, uh, where you will have maybe a church so that people will come together for common prayer, uh, or they'll have a common elder, but they'll essentially live on their own. And then we have the, the anchorites, or the hesychists, those who, who live almost in complete isolation. And if you go to Mount Athos today, you have all three. You have people that, that live in caves that will only come to the church uh, to turn in some wood carving so that they can buy a little bit of dry bread. Uh, uh, you have the big, beautifully organized, put together almost like castles, monasteries. And then you have the, the skiti, the, the elder who lives in a little hut with his disciples near around him. Um, so we have the, the Desert Fathers, it kind of grows into, uh, it spreads there from Egypt to Palestine. We have people like St. Barsanufios and John, their disciple Dorotheos of Gaza. Uh, very early on, Sinai becomes a, a center of, of, of monasticism and asceticism. Um, there, of course, we have the famous St. John of the Ladder. Um, and we really have uh, St. John Chrysostom, right? He lived this monastic life. St. Gregory, St. Basil, the three hierarchs that we have lived there before becoming ordained, lived their life uh, essentially as monastics. So the, this role of monasticism begins to take more and more of, a, of an importance, right? Um, sadly, something that is not prevalent in our, our church today as it once was, was you also had urban monasticism. You would have these large monastic uh, communities within cities, within Constantinople, uh, the Monastery of Studios, uh, people like St. Simeon, the New Theologian, uh, actually lived in cities. You also had uh, uh, monastics who did, uh, uh, had hospitals that had, and, and we have some of this uh, in Russia, some of this in, in uh, Eastern Europe, uh, not yet really in this United States, uh, where we have these more uh, service-oriented monasteries. And some people will say that's uh, that's Western, that's not Orthodox. Uh, Fui, it is, it's Orthodox. Uh, there's not one kind of asceticism or monasticism. Now in the East, we don't have the orders that you hear about in the West the Benedictines, the Carmelites, the uh, Franciscans, the Dominican, all of that. We don't have that. Uh, what we do have is a more personal, right? If you go to uh, Xenofondos or Grigiriu or one of these other monasteries, it really takes on the character of the founder uh, who, who usually has its own kind of rule uh, and or the, the elder, the spiritual father of that monastic community. Um, and so there's, there's as many, really as many uh, flavors of monasticism as there are monasteries, as there are holy people. Um, in fact, you know, for those that want to be a monastic, uh, you know, I, people come to me, they'll, you know, Father, I'm, I'm thinking of it. Like, well, visit, visit a monastery, right? Get to know, because really, it's like marriage. The, the, you know, when I met uh, Cecilia, I knew right away, not everybody does. It took me about five years to convince her that she should marry me, but I knew right away. Uh, you know, it should be the same way. The person who wants to become a monk isn't like, I want to become a monk in this general term, but rather, meets a spiritual father and comes to a monastery that in a sense he falls in love with, is drawn to. Um, and that's where I've seen really healthy, successful monasticism. Same with marriage. You know, if you just want to be married, you know, and you're going to marry the first person who says yes, eh, that may not work out too well. God knows, it's in his hands. But, uh, <clears throat> 
should be this this loving attachment. So uh, we begin, uh, as we can see again with Chrysostom, Basil, Gregory, uh, more and more the bishops begin to be taken from the monasteries or from these monastic life. Uh, people like Saint Spiridon, we have early bishops. Gregory of Nyssa, the brother of Saint Basil, was a bishop. They were married. They were married. Saint Spiridon had a daughter, Irini, had a child. Uh, but as more and more of the episcopy, more and more of the bishops began to be drawn from the monastics, uh, eventually it becomes the norm, not yet canonical, but the norm that uh, the bishops are celibate. You never have the, the presbyters, otherwise I wouldn't be here, uh, but the bishops. And, and there's a really simple, really beautiful reason for that. Some people are like, oh, because the, the monastics were trying to take over the church. No, that wasn't it. <clears throat> there was a very early canon rule that, for whatever reason, has not been enforced for quite some time. If someone was to become a bishop, one of the requirements was that they have the Psalter memorized. Not the 50th Psalm. Not the six psalms we read in the Sunday morning at Orthros, but to have the book of Psalms memorized as a requirement to be a bishop. When uh, one of my professors at the seminary was, he was going to be consecrated as a bishop, I would tease him. He, like, he, 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 was, uh, he wasn't even a, a priest. He, he was just a priest for one week. He was a deacon, archdeacon. Archdeacon, Psalm 140, Go. Ah, uh, Fadim was stuck because he didn't have it memorized. I actually only know of one bishop who has the Psalter memorized, and that's our own All Holiness Patriarch Bartholomew. So anybody who uh, speaks ill of him, uh, I always, you know, you have the Psalms memorized. Um, so why does this mean that the bishops were being drawn from the monasteries? Because most of the monastics. They're, they're really, their life revolved around, or their daily life revolved around praying the Psalms. Right? That was the early prayer book of the church. Right? Uh, when we, we read about St. Anthony, we read about uh, these, these early desert fathers, you know, they're saying, the visitor, they have these little things going on, they're fasting, but what are they doing with their time? They're mostly reciting the Psalms. So most of these desert fathers would recite through the Psalter every single day. Because the Amanathos, they do it, they go through it once a week, but they do a lot of other services. Uh, so they would go through the Psalter. So the Psalms became a very important part of this rising monasticism and asceticism. Um, and if you're saying it every day, beginning to end, now, keep in mind, this is the biggest book of the Bible. Uh, it takes a good chunk of the day to get through, especially if, if you're reading it out loud, prayerfully. Um, uh, you'd end up memorizing it. And so, who has the psalm, the psalter memorized? The monks. So they're the ones that are becoming the bishops. Um, uh, at this time, we begin to have two different styles of, of, of liturgy of worship um, you have the monastic rite like this is the worship that comes from the monasteries uh, mostly Jerusalem uh, eventually Mount Athos um, and it was actually somewhat distinct from the worship that would take place in the parish right? uh, and, and you know don't have time now to really get into it but uh we kind of had these distinct liturgical traditions. The monastic, the sometimes referred to as the cathedral rite, growing, going up together. And then when we get to the time of iconoclasm, right, when the different imperial powers uh, began to, to destroy the icons, uh, the real champions of the icons were not the bishops or the priests, but the monastics. 
And so after the iconoclastic controversy, after the Seventh Ecumenical Council, after the restoration, the triumph of Orthodoxy, we celebrated the Sunday of Orthodoxy, uh, the monastics had an even more important role in the church. And really from that time on, we begin to see the, the liturgical music, the tradition uh, of the monastery, uh, in some ways assuming different aspects of the, the city worship, city liturgy, um, but ultimately replacing. So the, really the, the Orthros, Vespers, uh, liturgical tradition that we have today is, is that of the monastery throughout the Orthodox world. Um, so the worship of the church is very much shaped by, by, the, by the monastics. Um, in the 14th century, we get another controversy. Um, we have uh, a group of scholastics who see what is being done in Monopos. They see these people that are reciting the Jesus prayer over and over and over again. Often sitting in a circular, their head on their chin, looks almost like they're staring at their, their navel. So they would actually mock them, ah, oh, the navel gazers. Uh, and uh, they said, what are you doing? And, and these, these monastics, these, these holy people said uh, that through the recitation of the Jesus prayer, uh, their mind is brought back into the body. There it's united by God's grace. It descends into the heart. And as the Lord says, the pure in heart will see God. And they're experiencing these visions of light. And that light itself is God and his uncreated glory. And these scholastics, they said, ah, that's ridiculous. That's not how you get to know God. You have to get to know God by, by reason, by logic, by study. And we have kind of this proto-scholasticism. Uh, in fact, many of these people did study in the West. And when uh, the church decreed that the hesychists, those practicing the Jesus prayer, uh, were properly understanding the faith, Many of these uh, kind of humanist-minded people ended up going to the West and becoming Catholic. Um, and actually, that might have been part of what led to scholasticism, uh, people like Thomas Aquinas. But this, this is an important thing to remember, and this is something that in some ways does go all the way back uh, to the Desert Fathers. But even before that, right, uh, part of uh, the Jewish uh, practice, right? And when we see this in the Old Testament, but I, I, th I think we're so kind of removed from the practice of it uh, that we don't notice it. But if you're reading through the Old Testament, it doesn't matter. Psalms, prophets, the law, you will see it again and again. Bless the name of the Lord. By the name of the Lord. Call on the name of the Lord. Name, 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 name. Right? And this, this was the practice, going all the way back to the Hebrew people, that they would call on the Lord. They would recite a line of the Psalms. Have mercy on God according to your great mercy, according to your great mercy. Have mercy on God according to your great mercy. That this, this became a prayer, a single line prayer taken from the Psalms. Sometimes it would just be a recitation of the, the, the name of God silently within oneself. Uh, or Glory to you, God, glory to you. Uh, and this was, this was a practice, right? Uh, the Desert Fathers did the same thing. They would take either just the recitation of the name or one of the names of the Lord. They would just recite it over and over again. Uh, another thing that they would do is they would take lines from the Psalms or throughout the Old Testament that were specific to a specific temptation, right? And these were sometimes referred to as arrow prayers, right? So to put it, to put it simply, let's say like uh, you're, you're living in this keli in the middle of the desert and you begin to be tempted by, uh, uh, begin to be tempted by a vain thought. Start to get 
you know, look at me sitting here in the desert while everybody else is eating their food and living. I'm, I'm doing the gospel. I'm doing the real thing. So they're being attacked by this lo me, this thought that the, the demon is shooting at them like an arrow, this vain thought. So what they would do is they would actually compile different verses, right? So maybe the verse would be uh, where Christ says, Be as I am, friend, meek and lowly of heart. So that becomes the arrow. So you're being attacked by this vain thought of the devil. So you shoot back and you just recite this prayer, this line of scripture over and over again. Our Lord says, Be as I am, friend, meek and lowly of heart. Be as I am, friend, meek and lowly of heart. And, and uh, the shortness of it, the simplicity of it, allows the mind to, to stay present on it and focus instead of scattering all around, right? And you're shooting back this demon that's attacking you with this thought of vanity. Um, already by the, really the fifth, sixth century, we begin to see that uh, these prayers begin to be more and more, it's the Jesus prayer that's used. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. And this, of course, when we get to the Hesychus controversy in the 14th century, uh, is the, the, the main work of the monastic. Together with the reciting of the Psalms, the church services, is this recitation of, of the Jesus prayer. Um, and, uh, of course, this, again, isn't something that's just for monastics. It's something that we can do. And I think in this day and age, uh, in some ways, it's it's uh, it's easier, right? If uh, if I'm busy, if I have work, if I have these things, I may not have time to to go. I think take that back. Everybody has time. I may not want to be able to feel like I can make time to stand in front of my icons for 15 minutes and to to read prayers from a prayer book and light the candeli and, and burn some incense. Um, but how many of us strive to work? Right? Turn the radio on. Say the Jesus prayer. Right? Just imagine. You get stuck in traffic, and before you're like, ah. Now you're like, I get another 20 minutes to sit in the presence of Christ, to say the prayer. Right? You know, when, when we're walking the dog in the morning, you know, our mind could wonder, or we could bring it back within us into the temple of the heart and say, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy. And so this, this simple prayer helps us uh, sanctify, to set apart and to offer up to God our daily lives. Right? And we can say it for people. If, if uh, we have a family member who's in trouble or going through a difficult time, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy. You can say the name or not to the name, but he knows who it is that we're calling for help. Uh, we find ourselves in a difficult situation. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy. And uh, in a sense, we have two rhythms within ourselves, right? So you have our breathing, and we have our heart beating, right? And if we think about it, if we go all the way back to the very beginning of Genesis, what do we hear? We hear of the Holy Spirit, breath, hovering above the waters. Right? So in a sense, each and every one of us, we have this breath that we can join with the name of Christ, and what does St. Paul say? He says we can only call him Lord by the Holy Spirit. So by the fact that we're saying Lord Jesus, the Holy Spirit is present in that prayer. You know, our very breath becomes a sacrament. Right? Our very breath contains the name of God. And as this prayer enters into us, it uh, touches that other part, that other cycle which is our heart. And so that prayer begins to spread throughout the body, just as the blood spreads our breath throughout our body. You know, the whole person is in living. And that grace then can actually pour out to others around you. Right? If, if uh, 
never had the blessing to meet someone who's really a, a person of prayer, you know, you sense it. You can, you can feel it. Uh, you know, there, there was a, a, a priest on campus uh, who people were just like, you know, you're walking in a straight line and he's over here and you just notice you're like, you don't even realize it. Like a, like a magnet, right? And he'd just be sitting there praying. He didn't advertise himself, didn't just his prayer, right? Um, and so the final thing to conclude with is uh, I think that we need to, uh, again, we think of monasticism as something very foreign, something very different, something very extreme oftentimes. We think kind of married life, monastic life, <coughs> And both of them are important and necessary for the church, but I, I think we sometimes forget how much we have to communicate to each other, right? Uh, there's this monastic elder who said something once beautiful. He said, uh, for 17 years, my parents couldn't stand each other. They were always fighting. They were always arguing. He says, then I became a monk, and they began to visit me at the monastery. And you know what they did? They robbed the monastery. They didn't steal the treasures of the monastery. They stole the treasures of the monastery. They learned about prayer, about fasting. He says, and after 17 years of, of one sustained fight, they spent the next 30 years in the most beautiful harmony with each other. Right? We can take something right, from the mon monastic tradition. And, and likewise, right, the monks can look to us. Right? They need to take something, right? If the monk isn't passionately in love with the life, with the community, in the same way that we love our family, there's something that's going to be missing there. Right? Uh, you know, the, the monk should... When he gets up at two o'clock in the morning to say the Jesus prayer, should it have the same, uh, not always happy, not always easy, but the same joy that I have when I get up to change Mikali's diaper. Right? Not always happy, but a joy because this is my child, a joy because this prayer is being brought forth by the monk. So remember, we can learn from each other. We can draw from each other. Any questions about monasticism, monastic life? All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.